conversation with John Walker, painter and teacher. Our interviewer today is Lizzie Carter Oliver. Lizzie was a studio art major here, graduated in 2005, and worked very closely with Jimmy Kathy Hillen. Um, she went on to get her MFA at Boston University. I'm trying not to get the feedback going, so I don't know, I'm not sure where to stand. Is this okay, Jerry? Okay. Is this better? Okay, great. <laughs> and she earned her MFA there in 2013, working very closely with John Walker. Lizzie has about as robust a legacy as anyone could have here. She, uh, her great great aunt was Gilly Larue of the famed, the wonderful uh, teaching award. Um, very coveted award here at the college, and 14 of her relatives attended the college as Randolph Macon Women's College. So, welcome back, Lizzie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, I am very excited to introduce to you all my teacher, John Walker. He is Professor Emeritus of Painting at Boston University. He's the recently retired director of the MFA painting program there. He is a painter and a printmaker. He has won numerous awards, including the Harkness and the Guggenheim. He has had solo shows at the Museum of Modern Art, the Phillips Collection, and the Tate Gallery, among others. He's been called one of the standout abstract painters of the last 50 years. So welcome, John, to my alma mater, randolph Macon Women's College. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this show, One Place, Two Views, is an exploration of place and landscape of your home in Maine. You were born in 1939 in Birmingham, England. Can you talk about your youth, the experience of that place, and how that influenced your early experiences in art? Well, that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, well, I grew up in Birmingham, which is a heavy industrial city in New England. Uh, I, uh, I think I did. Oh, oh one of the, actually one of the most formative things that ever happened to me was when I think I was seven, seven years of age. I, I, one of my teachers selected a uh, a drawing I made um, and pulled it on my desk and took it to the front and pinned it on the wall and said, look what John did. And so I, was, I was going to be in trouble. But what I've done, somehow I've worked out, we've had to illustrate something out of the stories of Robin Hood or something. And I've done the Robin Hood is many men running through a show, of course. And uh, but what I've actually done is articulate the limbs on uh, these figures. And uh, she told me that because everyone was still drawing stick figures. And so I managed to work out. Uh, and I realized at that moment I was the most intelligent person in the class. <laughs> Only, only in drawing. Uh, <laughs> and I, I sort of rushed over to my mother and said, I'm going to be a painter. And, uh, and fortunately, my mother, with all of my was a sort of cleaning lady, uh, she encouraged me. And that's how I started. Uh, and, uh, and then I went to at the age of 11, I went to a junior art school. There had to be in those days, they were all it was junior music school, and art schools, and around the city. And so and I was trained from the age of 11 to uh, 16 in uh, really uh, technical illustration. In other words, we were all. Uh, being sort of uh, trained to be artisans and not artists. I mean, uh, 
And when I finished that, I went to art school early at 16, at the college. Body didn't come a little. So, um, and the training there was very sort of uh, traditional, academic. Lots of work, uh, great teachers. They could all, all draw like angels. I mean, they actually used to show you how to do it, not talk, so they could show you how to do it. Uh, it was great training.
have to you have to bring it and I'll help you paint it. So the thing will illuminate it or whatever form. And um, after you had won the Morris Prize and, and your career had started to take off, um, it was in that time that Betty Parsons right. showed up at your studio. Yeah. That must have been a surprise. Yeah, because I was painting in isolation. I was uh, still driving the truck and, uh, and painting in, uh, in an isolated country, uh, small village. And uh, as I said, this elderly woman walked into my studio and asked if she could have a look. She was staying in the village and someone had told her to ask her. So she came in and uh, she spent looking, looking and looking. And I was painting possibly large pictures. You know, I was at that sort of age when I was in love with all those wonderful photographs of American artist studios full of huge paintings. And How big were they? My paintings were the like, average size was 22 feet by 9 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was getting this, and I had piles of them, you know, I don't think I'd ever sold a painting in my life at that point. Um, so I had all these paintings, and we, we went through them, and after several hours of looking and a cup of tea, she said, she told me who she was. She had a gallery in New York, and her name was Betty Parsons, and would I like to have a show? And that's how we met, and that's really my first show. I think the first one-night show I had was in New York, rather than London, you know, uh, yeah, I think that was in 1967, something like that. And of course, there was this, and she was true, we, we became good friends. And she, she'd come to London quite a lot of the time, we'd always go off on a trip somewhere together. And, uh, and, uh, she was, I, I once dared to ask her, because what happened, she lost a lot of her, her important artists, you know, they moved to other galleries. Um, so she lost Pollock, Rothko, and Curtin Still. And I asked her about that, and I said, well, what, uh, what happened exactly? And she, she said, well, the, the, this important group of artists that came to her, I think it was like six of them, and said, we were being offered other galleries that people are offering us, but we'd like to stay with you, but there's a condition. And the condition was to her was that she would just concentrate on these five or six artists. There would be, a, there'd be no other artists in the gallery. And she, she said, could she have time to think about it? So, you know, she, they, they gave her a week. They went back after a week and said, have you made a decision? And she says, yeah, I can't do it. She says, and they said, why not? She says, and her answer was beautiful. It was like, well, as an art dealer, I like to cultivate a big garden. <laughs> so she turned down like, a, a fabulous fortune, really, though she'd never been able to sell their art when it was with the gallery. You know, and believe it or not, I was the other day, some paper, a Jackson Pollock you could have bought for a hundred dollars. And, and he didn't sell anything. The first two shows here, he didn't sell the thing. And, and of course, all, all these people know. <laughs> and American art. Mm. But she was like that. She was a. She really loved art and, and, uh, and the business of encouraging artists. You know. was, unlike most dealers now who love money rather love art. You know. Shouldn't say that, should I? <laughs> um, so after showing with Betty Parsons, you won a Parkness Fellowship, and that brought you to the United States, to New York, for two years. Um, can you talk about the way that you fit into that American art world? Yeah, well, the, the Parkness Fellowship is like a grant that was given to, like, rather like a rose, uh, sort of very reversed, which was sponsored by one of the Parkness family. And he brought all kinds of scholars to the United States to spend two years, and then you had to go back from where you came from and tell everyone how wonderful the United States was. <laughs> Which was fair, they paid money very well. 
And so I came to New York. I'd been visiting New York. I'd been sure the Jewish Museum and the Guggenheim. So I knew I'd met a few people. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was great. I came, I had a small two young children. Uh, believe it or not, we, at, at that time, we took up, I had a place down in Soho, but in Little Italy, actually, on Grand Street. And, and then, though there were a lot of artists my age sort of pouring into Soho at that time, I, I think there was, there was one other artist, Jake Berta, had a child. But I, we were the only two families with children amongst all these thousands of artists. And uh, it was one of the time, I, I, unlike in England, I, where I felt extremely isolated from other artists, uh, here I sort of met people, uh, my peers and so on. I, I, it was a wonderful time to, uh, to be helped and by other artists, you know, having that kind of community. I never found any. That's lovely. Um, I think it's a real testament to the mayor and to Jim and Kathy. Um, Jake Berto has also been here for the Berlin Symposium and shown and um, really turned out for you guys. Um, John, I know that you consider yourself to come from a long tradition or a lineage of painters. I know that Goya, Constable, Matisse, and Rembrandt are all important to you. Can you tell me how they informed your work? You know, I, I, they're great painters. And, and, and as a painter, it was, in a sense, my business to know my, to know painting. And uh, even the, the, early on at art school, I found uh, in, the, in the library, I mean, in a cupboard that had almost never been opened, all the volumes of uh, Goya's etchings. Mm. So, you know, uh, the librarians didn't know they were there. I could have walked out with them, I think, at the time. <laughs> but I used to go and copy them, sit there and copy them around in the library and, and, and try and make them look like a Goya etching or something like that. So that was, I suppose that was my first serious attempt kind of deal with something important uh, other than just about what I, what I thought was something you know. So Goya became like a, he's been there for everything I do. You know, uh, he's, uh, there's almost never a day I don't think about it. But the nice thing about all these uh, drawings I did from these etchings was uh, he got me out of the life drawing class. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the professor who taught life drawing thought it was a waste of time me going into not the drawing for the figure. Just, uh, just keep doing the boys. And that was, uh, that, was a, that was really the, the moment I thought that I would I had a lot to learn. So I will, you know, I want to be a painter, so I want to know the business of painting, so I go look at paintings all the time, you know, and, 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 and the Goya thing, by the way, it, it, it's been con so constant the last time I was in Madrid, I walked, I walked around the corner into the, the, the black paintings room, and I he poetry started to cry. And the attendant was so upset, he got a chair for me. <laughs> sat me down and I know that he thought something was terribly wrong. I said, no, it's the most beautiful thing ever. You know, so, and I, if you ever go to Madrid, you see an old man crying in front of you. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, John, how would you suggest that today's art students engage with that history of art? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, as, as I've just said, it's their business. Uh, you, you know, you can't be an expert in your field unless you have acquired a lot of knowledge about it. So, you know, I would suggest to anyone who wants to be a major, but, but, you know, 
the aspirations uh, to be um, an artist of some strength is to, you should go and take on the real thing. You, know, uh, you can't, you, you've got to be in the major leagues or you've got to associate with people that are in the major leagues. So it's, it's not, you know, there's a lot to learn from Mr. Rembrandt, etc., etc. It's interesting. Uh, uh, like, uh, about that time, when I was an art student, I went. I went to Amsterdam. I wanted to go at that time uh, to see the Van Goghs. And uh, and of course, I spent all. Uh, which were wonderful, but I spent a lot of my time in front of Rembrandt's The Jewish Bride, which I still think is like. If the building was burning down, that's the picture I'd walk out with. You know, so if, and, uh, but it was, it was really important to me because uh, I came out of the, 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 after spending hours in front of the, the, the Rembrandt and I walked across to the Stedelijk Museum, the Museum of Modern Art there, and I walked in there and I was, I saw a Malevich painting. And I didn't know who Malevich was, no one at the art school had ever mentioned. I, mean, I was about 70, and uh, no one had mentioned, no one ever mentioned modern art or abstract art. And, uh, but I remember, I learned something really important, um, and it was disturbing at first, because I, I got the same feelings and sensations looking at this Malevich painting, who I didn't even know who he was at the time, as I'd got from looking at the Rembrandt. And, and I couldn't work it out, what makes you this big, you know, ignorance of so-called modern art, but contemporary art. And, uh, and yet I'm feeling for this, uh, just a white square on a white square, a uh, supremacist painting. And, uh, and then years later, I. I read, it, I read this thing that Malevich had been asked what his ambition was for painting. And he said it was to imbue a square with feeling. Well, it, that's exactly what Rembrandt had done. You know, and, 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 and he imbued this wonderful painting with this real, real human feeling. So it's always, uh, that was one of the most important things. It's always a challenge, is how do I get these paintings to be more than just what they are? Is that all right? That's great. Um, I remember when you first got to um, Bonn, when you were at Bosnia University, you sat all down, and he said, you simply cannot look at paintings on a computer screen ever again. Don't do it. Go straight to the museum. Um, and spend time with the paintings and try to understand the way that they were made and look for that feeling. Um, so when when you first went to Maine uh, in the 1960s, right. you started to have landscape ideas. I started to have them, but I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us about the ideas. Well, people think it was about at least 10 years, but probably more than that, before I could deal with the landscape. I'd, uh, I'd been going to do little things, but none of it was successful. And I was, the paintings I did were all made in the studio. I was a studio artist. And then and, and, and the landscape was, I couldn't deal with it because it was too scenic. It was too pretty. It was too much blue. Uh, and, uh, uh, so it, it took me a long time, and then I, I eventually found a spot of, of where I live, where all the uh, all the pollutants and everything sort of come in and are washed in, and it's kind of, we, call, we call it dirty coal. Uh, <laughs> but the, the old guy used to help me, the property used to call it. Oh, he, he said, 
why his name is Meryl Rice. Why did uh, when you go on painting that must the ugliest part of the property, you know, the, the, you know, that's where I could paint, you know, the, the, all the way sort of crap that floats in and, uh, and the tide goes out. So that that's how I got into into the sun the landscape and something that I could paint. So that's how I got it. But that took about 15 years before I could uh, use it. And those were some of the tidal pools that are uh, in the seal plate right, that right. are yeah, um, okay. the second and the fifth painting. Right. Um, I can tell you a quick story about Merrill Rice. Merrill Rice was this old man that uh, who, you know, worked, worked on the property. I sort of inherited him when I bought the property. And um, I, I sold uh, the, the two pictures to the Portland Museum in Maine. And one of them I called uh, Merrill Rice's Cove because he, 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 uh, and I told him, I said, you know, if you go to the museum, your paintings up on the wall, you know, and, and you know, and this, so he, he was excited by this. I think, the only time he'd ever been anywhere else. I think he'd only been to Boston once in his life. The only other time was during the Second World War, but he didn't have an option in that country. Uh, but he, he came back for two weeks later and he said, we went to the museum to see your painting. And, I said, and he says, and he got this, photo, this framed photograph of him and his family, it was a big family, standing in front of this painting. But they weren't gathered around the painting. They were gathered around the sign on the wall, which said, no <laughs> <laughs> But they were so thrilled. <laughs> Sorry, that's on the side. <laughs> um, so, John, um, you were making the seal, the seal point paintings, the third and the sixth painting, for quite a while. 20 years? Yeah, 15 years. 15 years. Um, and you recently, um, began to paint the sea. Right, the, the early paintings were about when the tide was out, and now the, the, the more recent paintings are more about when the tide's in. Do you call them low tide and high tide? Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the transition from low tide to high tide? Well, it happens every day, up and down. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I couldn't really pay it for the high tide. I always had to wait for the tide, but then I could go out and pay it. Low tide, that was much more interesting things to pay. And of course, it changes every time, bring something else in. So it's, it's, it's moving, it's constant, it's, uh, it's really bad change. That was the inspiration for the paintings. Yeah, it was this movement, and the dirt and the, and the mud. Yeah. And I used to mix the mud. You know, I'd get buckets of this mud and then mix it up and use it in the paintings. It just seems like a pretty significant shift in your palette um, from steel point to the, to the sea. The new paintings? Yeah. yeah. yeah I think Involves one changes, and sometimes one, what is one change? You know, I look at these earlier paintings, and they look much the best paintings here. Um, you know, uh, should have stayed <laughs> when the tide was out, sort of thing. You know. So I uh, now with the new paintings, I'm not. I'm still looking at them and watching them, and. Uh, And hope that uh, I feel the same way about them that I do the other ones. I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, but if they weren't different, the new ones to the other ones, then I would worry. You know, it's, it's I want the studio. I, I want to be able to go in the studio and, 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 and 
try not to repeat myself. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. It's very important. Painting is very important that it changes for me. You know, a lot of people that doesn't seem to worry about me. Stay very closed. Painting's a big thing, not a restricting thing. You, yeah. You've heard me when I've been teaching this. But I think it's also it's all um, embraced. really lovely and that you're finding so many new things. Um, that you also profess to paint the same thing right. over and over um, and seeing it in different ways and the way that it feels. Yeah, that's a, that, I, I think you're right. There's nothing in the paintings that I haven't seen. You know, it's, uh, it's like a lot of accumulation of knowledge. Yeah, everything I see in the paintings, I, I know. Yeah. Keep painting it over and over? A little. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. I think Martha is ready for us to um, open up for questions. Any questions out there? So forth. 
many of them. So I wasn't aware of them. But, um, actually, it's one of the things that I find irritating is when people use those people to talk about my work. You know? Because, <laughs> I don't, I don't feel like I'm a real neighbor. <laughs> Which I'm told by the locals all the time, I'm not. <laughs> I never think of those graduates as students as students. She was 
a young woman who had been tested a little by life before she came to graduate school. And uh, those are the kind of people I admire. And she was great. She painted terrible paintings. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, we were all doing that. <laughs> she wasn't the only one. You know, but, uh, but, yeah, she, she was pretty terrible. She, we had a lot of fun. We used to play a lot. I mean, we worked very hard. We probably worked harder than that school than any graduate school. The graduate student worked anywhere. You know, uh, they worked seven days a week, twelve hour days. You know, they're always in the studio. It's, it's the one thing I demanded of them: is that don't don't waste this wonderful talent. You know, you know they're a wonderful group of uh, blessed blessed people. She was one of them. She, yeah. We were in the studio seven days a week because John was in the studio seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't dare uh, get caught. Uh, but yes, it was a, a really lovely time with a, a good group of people and a great group of teachers. Yeah. So, she was one of an exceptional group of very talented young people. It was always, it was always Enjoyable to uh, when I walked to school in the morning, I was like, wow, you know, looking forward to what's going to happen. But they're all surprising. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? You mentioned going to see the Van Goghs in Amsterdam yeah. and, and looking at the Rembrandt the whole time. And the one thing that struck me when I went is they're putting a lot of them under glass. The Van Goghs? Van Goghs under glass, or, and a lot of the masterpieces under glass, and you yeah. can't see the brush strokes and all that sort of other thing. Yeah. It, what are your thoughts on that, not being able to actually study the paintings anymore? Well, that, 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 uh, I mean, I presume they're putting them under glass to protect them. Right, well, of course. From, bio, <coughs> from people, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I can't see any other reason you would put a painting under glass. In fact, one of the nice things that ever happened to me was uh, at one point I was uh, artist in residence at Leeds University it was three years and uh, the head of the art department was a man called Lawrence Gowling who was a very famous writer on art and, uh, and an artist himself and, and, and during this time he was made like interim director of the Tate Gallery while they were looking for someone. And one of the, uh, and I went in there with him, he just got the job and we were down in the storage rooms underneath the tape. And we found all these paintings on the glass, all these turns on the glass that had been on the glass for probably half a century. And, uh, and we took the glass off. And these pictures, and we did a big exhibition then traveled actually to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, these terms. And we took the glass off and suddenly these paintings you know, were real paintings again. You know, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I've seen people put glass off paintings to take the composition you know, from violence these days. You know. uh, it's, yeah, it's a horrible thing that's happened. Time for one more question. Okay. What about the students? And the students have a question. The shops. Here we go. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, 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 that choice that brought you to painting? That brought me to painting? That brought you to painting. That brought me to mind. Oh, well, I was, that was Benny Parsons again, who I was, you know, in Manhattan, with two small children. And she thought it was a dreadful place to be in August in Manhattan. And so she had a friend who had a cottage up in there. And that was my first, it was 1970, I think, that was my first. So that, uh, <coughs> First time I went to that. 
So it was really just to get out. And that happened. Uh, but then I think I think that was it. I have been going back ever since. You know, uh, and now is that full time. Yeah. So Matt, uh, Matt's place, you know, I love that thing in, in New York. They talk about if you, as an artist, if you want to be seen or be on the scene, then you have to spend your songs in the Hamptons. If you're an artist who wants to work, you've got to know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Kayla's the artist. Yes. I'm just a husband. <laughs> <laughs> 